for so now we um, see the speakers and I kindly ask Christian and Lydia also to turn on the camera. Um, so there are more questions. So one question is uh, in fact to Christian Kehler mm -hmm. on um, whether it's still possible to take airplanes given the circulation of the virus can we safely fly or what's your view on this so what to do in airplanes yeah there are um, um, detailed studies going on now in the future about this uh, issue the DLI in Göttingen for instance they they want to study that um, what I know so far is that the um, ventilation system in the aircraft is quite good so they have very good filters inside and the air usually goes from the top to the bottom. So from this point of view, uh, it, it could be, uh, let's say, uh, acceptable uh, taking an aircraft if, uh, let's say, the air condition works well. But uh, still, I think it's better to have some uh, spaces in between where no, nobody is, um, is uh, sitting. But of course, this will raise the, uh, the cost. Anyhow, I think uh, further research has to, um, has to be done in this field because the aircraft are also quite different and also the, the air conditioning system. So I cannot make a, a general comment about that. Thank you. Daniel also has a comment on this. Yeah, so I learned from an airplane expert this afternoon that most of the air in an airplane actually comes from the outside uh, and only a small part is recirculated and that goes through HEPA filters, which are the filters that filter out all the uh, virus particles. So okay. I would take an airplane, I said on the radio this, <laughs> this afternoon. Good. So I have another question to Viola, and the question is whether your model has also been applied to other countries. So right now you showed the data for Germany, and the question is, uh, what about other countries? I mean, there are many, uh, uh, it's a huge amount of data around. Did you apply the model to those data? Um, yes, the model has been applied to a number of other countries, both by our group, so by us, as well as by other groups. So we have been contacted by num numerous groups uh, who wanted to adapt them to their own countries. One of the challenges to adapt it is that one has to be very careful with the priors to select where precisely um, a political intervention has happened and uh, how it might have been um, taken up and uh, implemented by the population is really differs from country to country so it, with applying this model one can't just throw in the data but one also has to know a lot about the local uh, policies and the local dynamics in that specific country but yes it is done well, thanks a lot i have a question to lydia uh, so in fact various people ask about the role of humidity and the role of temperature uh, on the lifetime of the aerosols and on the spreading uh, yeah, so this is this is still a subject of ongoing research, and and the, the there's always contradictory also results for other viruses, for, for influenza in particular, that has been looked at extensively, and, and understanding the mechanisms involved is still unknown. For the coronavirus family, however, we know that they are more robust typically than viruses, so we would expect that whatever effect uh, applies to influenza would be much uh, much dampened uh, in terms of, of effect on, on coronavirus. For example, MERS is a virus, there's a cousin of coronavirus that still that circulates and still endemic in, in Saudi Arabia, which is a hot place. So we don't expect that that will be, um, that will be a, a, a dramatic in, uh, implication in terms of pandemic development based on these parameters. Okay, thanks a lot. I have another question to Viola, and this is uh, on the skewness of the distribution. So I think from the press it's known that there's a super spreader event and there's a quite some skewness. Uh, many people don't infect anybody, but a few people in, infect uh, tens or even hundreds of people. Uh, so this is, I think, called kappa value or K value. Um, can your uh, models also make some predictions on that? And can you uh, illuminate the role of the skewness of the distribution? Um. Yes and no. Uh, the short answer is um, no, we cannot with our models infer the skewness of the distribution. There are better models to do that explicitly. We can have a different look at it, which is um, these super spreading events typically happen at large events, family events or large gatherings. And uh, we saw that stopping large gatherings has in absolute terms a pretty large effect on the spreading. 
And this might have exactly to do with this a long tailed um, distribution of the number of um, infected persons. So with this strong skewness. Um, well, thanks a lot. So um, I, I have a question to, to Lydia again. And this is the, again, the uh, role um, of um, the, um, uh, on, on the transmission of uh, the virus through these droplets with uh, other uh, uh, respiratory viruses. So uh, apparently this is what is suggested is that some respiratory diseases uh, are not transferred airborne, but on other routes. And uh, can you say something about this? So what is the threshold um, and uh, what is the concentration uh, of the virus in saliva? Can you comment on that? Uh, sure. So, so I want to clarify just uh, maybe one important point about how these diseases are classified with respect to their route of transmission. So a lot of the conclusions about how a disease is transmitted is actually arrived at not by doing physical measurements of what is coming out, but in fact from epidemiological data, population data, where uh, we're looking at uh, patterns and clusters and basically concluding that if uh, clusters typically occur in co-located spaces or families, then it must be more of a short range, uh, therefore big drop, large drop transmission route. So that's an important point because that's really how a lot of the guidelines are developed, not actually based on direct measurements. So even for the, the, the diseases that indeed would in, in fact be contaminated through surfaces, uh, that's also not necessarily uh, a conclusion that is arrived at by these measurements on surfaces. So that's number one. Number two, when we find clusters of infection in an indoor space for a family setting, there is no way to in fact distinguish between uh, the contamination that could have occurred from picking up something from a surface, from a close interaction, or from what was in the air. So that's another important point, because then you're trying to really map out a concept based on the wrong data set. Um, so the only way that you would be able to discriminate would be, in fact, to do experiments where we measure what comes out, fall on the surface, uh, get the concentration there, which, which are experiments that were not done either. So to conclude that large drop is the dominant route, there is no data that, in fact, sampled from a surface and showed that that drop was used and then infected another individual. But uh, that is being, um, so, so that's, that's number one. Number two, uh, the current studies in environmental sampling that were done showed that the virus could be detected. So just the presence of the virus in, 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 um, in vents, in corridors, uh, and you know, hours after the individuals have left. So this is consistent with the fact that you wouldn't have everything just being on the surface, sticking to it. You would have still circulation in the air. Now, the second piece, of course, is the, the load and the survival, survival, the ability of the virus to infect. And that's where really the technical limitations in sampling and in fact finding a live bar particle is a true scientific barrier. It doesn't mean that it's not there, but uh, lab experiments are the standards right now. And when aerosolization of these viruses has been done in lab experiments in a number of studies now, uh, in fact, the virus could be found to remain uh, infectious in, in that artificial environment for at least three hours. And three hours with the limit uh, where the experiments in fact stopped. And the other experiments were done where it was found that it could remain also infectious for more than that. So the mounting evidence is suggesting that we cannot exclude the, the fact that this virus is in, is in these, um, these particles because we find the virus in the air, uh, including air vents, which is not consistent with the idea that the virus would be only in a large blob that fall on the surface immediately. And second, the mounting evidence of lab experiments suggests that it can survive for hours in that droplet state. Well, thanks a lot, Lydia. I have a question to Christian, and this is on his view on homemade masks. Yeah, I uh, proposed that at the beginning of the pandemic uh, because uh, um, we were short in, in masks and uh, it was not clear how uh, the development of the infections will move on. And at that point, um, I, um, um, let's say, uh, made some uh, videos and some masking uh, tests uh, to produce, uh, to test self-made masks. And uh, it turns out that most of the self-made masks are not working at all. And this is really a, a problem. So my recommendation is um, to, uh, to buy, let's say, good masks. And with a good mask, I mean uh, FFP2 for self-protection if possible. 
and uh, then you are safe even when you are um, pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. And uh, of course, when uh, millions of people will be get infected and uh, we cannot get the mask anymore, we have to build them by ourselves. And there are a few materials that can be used, uh, but it's better when the government uh, makes sure that we get the material and then we can fabricate them by ourselves. So that would be my recommendation to have the proper material because it's not good to recommend that um, um, that, uh, let's say, a fabric is good for a mask. That's not the case. You need something which is really, really good. That's the point. Thanks a lot. So I have a question um, to um, Viola. And uh, let's see. So the, the question is... Uh, is Um, I think, well, probably it's already answered. Um, well, that uh, was uh, on um, the undetected cases. So there are various cases which have not yet been detected and different countries have the different ways of um, uh, testing, different percentage of uh, testing. So how do these uncertainties uh, affect your models? The most important part uh, initially to say is if the fraction of reported cases, let's talk about the fraction of reported cases, if this is sufficiently constant, then our results will not be changed as long as the S1 doesn't have extremely many uh, immune, so recovered people. Um, and, within, and we think for Germany, there's high evidence that we are in that regime of fairly um, reliable, uh, fairly reliable and constant um, and the reporting fraction. If, however, there is a strong change in reporting and suddenly you uh, report double or triple uh, of the cases compared to before, um, then such a change will obviously also be uh, visible in the observed case numbers. And uh, the good part with our type of model is that it typically only influences then the change points or the change point nearby and is absorbed by the other change points. So the largest concern about reporting is in the initial phase where we have this experiential growth and uh, both the observed case numbers and the number of tests, uh, both they increased exponentially, uh, close to exponentially. There is some concern that in this time we had been uh, increasing under reporting. That would mean the, exponent, the observed exponential growth was slower than the true exponential growth because there weren't enough tests available. This would mean that the first um, R, the R zero is misestimated, but the subsequent ones are not. Um, we looked very carefully into trying to understand whether or not there is a strong uh, underreporting. And we are basically really writing a report on that now because it's a huge debate in Germany. Um, we do not find evidence that there is a strong bias in the observed case numbers. Oh, thanks a lot. Yeah. So I have a question from, from my micro, microbiology is, and well, the problem is that the microbiologists don't know the, the number of viruses which is needed to cause an infection. How many aerosol droplets are needed to cause another person to become infected? So uh, can, can you say something on that or someone of you? I mean, there are some um, some guesses now how many uh, viruses you need, and uh, the but the, the number varies quite uh, quite strongly from 500 to more than a thousand or a few thousand. So if you have only uh, little droplets, let's say uh, one micrometer and a bit larger, they cannot carry so many uh, viruses. So you have to inhale uh, quite a lot of them. Anyhow, uh, in an um, let's say um, a cork, there are many uh, of these particles. So um, um, it's still an um, uncertain question and it's also very difficult to answer because it depends on the uh, receptors in the lungs, for instance, and, um, and uh, let's say uh, the health conditions and many other um, parameters. So uh, there is no true answer, let's say, valid for all people. It's very specific. Okay, well, thanks a lot. The virologist would even say that it's not clear whether the particles that are in aerosols are still uh, able to cause the virus, yeah, because their their protein code may be damaged, etc. So it's a very difficult virology question. 
that should be answered by the virologists? <laughs> Well, typically, typically it's animal experiments that are done to, to answer these questions. And so that takes time. They're starting to be doing that. And, and we know these numbers for well-established infections. It's just very hard to determine at a very early stage. So I have another question for Lydia. So uh, why do you think that uh, there are some biologists who are opposed to the idea that there can be infection through aerosols? aware of virologists that are opposed to this idea. I think that it's more on the epidemiology sort of public policy and where the idea has been really pushed, uh, pushed, uh, pushed aside. And it's more of a more of a historical, uh, you know, dogma with the aerosol large drop dichotomy, which is making it very hard to think about uh, the routes as, as in the way that we see these visualizations telling us uh, uh, in fact, take place. So, so you really have, you're really at the end stuck with this idea that anything that would be airborne or aerosol would be something that infect a whole building or in a whole city, sort of measles uh, type. And it's because we think if it's small aerosols, maybe that it will stay alive forever, goes everywhere. We expect to see then the whole population infected. But that is just the impression that people are, are left with thinking about me associating measles with airborne transmission. And, and this false, again, dichotomy of the concept of what is an aerosol and is a drop. A drop can become an aerosol. You have evaporation occurring throughout. So there is no sharp boundary between those two modes of transmission. And I think that's really the crux here where we keep debating a concept that is ill-posed. And once we clarify that concept, we can talk about time, distance, risk, probabilities, and, and in fact, advance forward instead of sort of arguing about a, a, a nomenclature. Well, from, from my point of view, uh, there are some uh, diseases which are known to be uh, airborne like measles, and they have a very large uh, R factor. However, uh, this R factor will, of course, vary from disease to disease and, uh, because the concentration of the virus in saliva will be different and because a different number of viruses will be um, necessary to get the infection. So that, that the R factor is, I think, without any measures taken, only two or three for corona doesn't mean at all that it is not airborne. It can be airborne, and I think the evidence for this is, meanwhile, overwhelming. I have another question on um, to either to Dario or Christian or to anybody, and this is on good ventilation concepts. So for theater or restaurants, uh, what is a good ventilation concept? So right now we have summer, and people are outside and that's fine, but well, at some point uh, we will get uh, autumn and winter again, and then we really need good ventilation concepts for uh, public spaces. What's your recommendation, Christian and, uh, and Daniel? Christian, Oh, Daniel, you can start. So yeah, sure. So I'm I'm already talking to uh, people like uh, building engineers, etc. And so it's it's our our measurement is simple to do. Yeah, the measurement you showed in the very beginning, um, and so it can be done in any uh, environment. And so the only question is how much air do you need to recirculate, and how do you want to organize the recirculation with the correct filters, etc. Uh, Christian, can you um, can you add something, or, or Lydia, perhaps Christian uh, keeps offline. Lydia, can you add? Uh, sorry, I was answering another question on the, the ah, forum on on ventilation concepts. On the need on the on the use uh, on, on, on good ventilation concept. Oh. To, um, uh, to get rid of the aerosols. Right, right. So, so, on average, so if we think about this on, on, on average, obviously if we increase the number of air changes in, in their space, we would expect that whatever is still residing there to be diluted and reduced in concentration. But as a bulk sort of you know, blanket recommendation, I would, I would still call for caution because then the details of the airflow, how it's optimized, depending on the occupancy, the type of, of, of geometry and, and, and number of individuals and, and also uh, devices that can be heat sources can create certain pockets of concentration of others. And, and th thinking also about, for example, opening a window, if we are in a restaurant and infected individuals is at that window and the window is open, but the air goes in, then we are in fact exposing others. So, so on average, as a concept, obviously of increasing the air changes in venting is actually really beneficial and we should, we should plan for that. But for the detailed adaptation of current settings, for managing this for reopening, 
uh, more specific recommendations should be developed for given working spaces and uh, particularly for thinking about high density occupancy. Well, thank you. I have a, a last question which I would like to take, and this is on um, concentration of the virus in saliva. Is it useful to, to think of mouthwash products containing a kind of soap to get rid of the virus? In fact, uh, I know cases uh, of uh, in fact family who had to go to the dentist and then the dentist uh, claimed, well, this is not much of a problem. You simply um, uh, take, take this mouthwash and um, then things would be okay. So what's your view on this? I, uh, I, 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 as a dentist, I would feel a little bit uneasy, I must say, but perhaps uh, Lydia or Daniel uh, or Christian or Viola have more information on this. So, um, I mean, I can talk just about, you know, from uh, there is no evidence that should suggest that, but it all depends again on the mechanics of, of the process. When we are aerosolizing, it goes from the whole respiratory tract, and the mouthwash obviously is tackling only the upper part. So, depending you know, on again the concentrations that day, uh, you might reduce for for a little time, maybe a certain certain load from one little portion of the respiratory tract. But that wouldn't that wouldn't physiologically or physically there wouldn't be any other indication that suddenly everything goes away because we are tackling a small portion of the respiratory tract. Uh, okay. Well, I would like to thank all participants. So first of all, the speakers, uh, Lydia, and Christian, and Viola, and Daniel. But I also would like to uh, thank the people from the Dutch Academy for making this possible. And I also would like to thank the audience. We had a lively discussion. Uh, many questions were, were answered. So uh, I think we had 50 or, 50 or 60 questions. And you can, of course, uh, contact all of us by, by email. Uh, we got many questions and we do our best to answer them. Uh, thanks for your interest. And let's hope that the virus is getting uh, under control and that the uh, correct measures are taken and that, that indeed, I mean, science moved on from 1919 to, uh, to now 101 years and we know a lot more now and that this knowledge will be used in a beneficial way that we don't have to rely on empirical rules from 1919, but uh, that a good and rational measures are taken and also on an international scale. And with this, I would like to end and thank all of you once more. Thank you, Detlef. Thank you.